Greetings, I'm the dentist. Welcome back to Dent Agenda. This is Chapter 3, Pediatric Dentistry. In this tutorial, we will discuss the anatomy of primary teeth in comparison to permanent teeth and how it affects cavity design. Primary teeth differ in several aspects from permanent teeth affecting both the sequel of dental disease and its management, and these are the portions we are going to compare. Starting with enamel. Enamel colour. Deciduous teeth appear more bluish white due to the thinner enamel, rather than greyish or yellowish white as in permanent teeth. Enamel thickness. Enamel in primary teeth is about 1 mm thick, which is half of that of permanent teeth, which ranges from 2 to 3 mm, which affects the colour and renders fast carous progression to dentine and then to pop. And that is why early detection and regular checkups is mandatory in children. The direction of enamel prisms or enamel rods. In the cervical third of primary molars, the enamel prisms are inclined in an occlusal direction, so there is no need to bevel the gingival floor of a proximal box, as in permanent teeth, in which the cervical enamel prisms are inclined gingivally or epically. Next point, dentine. Dentine thickness, permeability and hardness. In primary teeth, dentine is half the thickness of that in permanent teeth. It's also more permeable and easier to cut through. Unlike that of permanent teeth, in which dentine is thicker, less permeable and harder in consistency. Now let's compare the pulp. Firstly, let's compare the pulp size. The pulp chamber in primary teeth is proportionally larger, with more accentuated pulp horns. In the upper D's and E's, there are three pulp horns, mesobuccal, distobuccal, and palatal. In the lower D's and E's, however, there are four pulp horns, mesiobuccal, mesiolingual, distobuccal and distolingual. These features mean that the caries will affect the pulp sooner and there is a greater likelihood of pulp exposure during cavity preparation. That's why you should aim for only 0.5 to 1 mm penetration into dentine, except where caries determines deeper preparation. Pulp outline. It follows the amelodentinal junction more closely in primary teeth. Therefore, cavity floor should follow the external contour of the tooth sinuously to avoid pulp exposure. Radicular pulp. It follows a tortuous and branching path, making complete cleansing and preparation of the root canal system almost impossible although instrumenting canals is often easier than suggested in some cases. In addition, as the roots resorb in primary teeth, there is a different approach to root canal treatment is needed. Pure zinc oxide eugenol being the obturation material of choice in primary dentition, so it can resorb naturally with physiological root resorption. Unlike gutta percha and other plastic materials used in filling permanent roots. Accessory canals. They could be numerous in the vocation area of primary molars. This may explain the greater incidence of interradicular involvement following pulp death. 
cellularity and vascularity of the pulp. Deciduous pulp is richer in cells and vasculature, which renders it having more potential for repair, unlike in permanent teeth, where it gets more fibrous with age and decreased ability for repair. Now we compare the crown differences. Number one, occlusal table. There is greater convergence of the buccal and lingual walls of primary molars, resulting proportionally narrower occlusal table, unlike permanent teeth, where the occlusal table of the molars is much wider. This is more pronounced in the D's than E's, therefore, Overextension of an occlusal cavity buccolingually can lead to cusp weakening. Number two, contact. Primary teeth have broad, flat, and more gingerly located contact points, or in this case, since they are broad, they can be called contact areas. Whereas in permanent teeth, the contact is a point that is narrower and more occlusally located. This makes detection of the interproximal caries in primary dentition more difficult, and it means that the diversions of the buccal and lingual walls towards the approximal surface in primary molars is necessary to ensure that the cavity margins are self-cleansing. Here are some types of different teeth contacts between primary molars. Number one, when there is no contact between the primary molars, it is called open contact. Number two, when there is a point of contact less than or equal to 1.5 millimeters, it is called X-shaped contact. Number three, when there is a straight contact larger than or equal to 1.5 millimeters, it is called I-shaped contact. Number four, when there is a straight contact larger than 1.5 millimeters, it is called S-shaped contact. Number three, crown shape. Primary molars have a more bulbous crown form than permanent molars, making matrix placement more challenging. Number four, the cervical portion. Cervical constriction is more marked in primary molars since the crown is more bulbous in form. Therefore, if the base of the proximal box is extended too far gingerly, it will be difficult to cut an adequate floor without encroaching on the pulp. Number five, cervical ridges. Cervical ridges are more pronounced in primary teeth than in permanent teeth, especially on the buccal surfaces of the D's. Number 6. Mammillins. Mammillins are the serrations of enamel which break through the gums, allowing the entire tooth to break through it during the eruptive movement in permanent incisors. They are absent and not as pronounced in primary teeth. It might be due to their sharper edges and the more delicate gingiva at that stage. And they are present in the incisal edge of newly erupted permanent incisors. They can wear with time, but if the teeth are mal-aligned, they can persist in adulthood. Now let's compare the roots of permanent and primary teeth. Number one, root form. Primary molars have longer roots in proportion to their crowns in comparison to the permanent counterparts. They are also thin and cylindrical in form and more flared. Number two, resorption. Primary roots undergo physiologic resorption in the shedding process, which is normal. On the other hand, 
permanent roots do not resorb internally or externally unless pathologically, as in case of cysts or tumours, and in aggressive orthodontic treatment or trauma. Note that even when a permanent tooth derm successor is absent congenitally, although it is the primary stimulus for primary physiological root resorption, the resorption of the corresponding primary tooth might still occur due to various factors, such as inflammation, traumatic occlusal forces, and weakness of the periodontium. Number 3. Flaring. Primary roots are markedly flared apart to accommodate for the development of permanent teeth buds underneath. The roots are also flattened mesodistally as well as the canals within. On the other hand, permanent roots are less flared and they might even be fused in some cases. Last but not least, let's compare the periodontium. Number one, cementum. It is very thin and of the primary type in the deciduous dentition. Number two, bone. Alveolar atrophy is rare in children because it happens mostly when there is absence of teeth. And children's arches are full of teeth and teeth buds. That's why it is more common in adults, especially after tooth loss. Number three, gingiva. Both adults and children can get periodontal diseases. However, children are more susceptible to gingivitis, the mildest form of the disease. More advanced types of periodontal diseases are not common in kids, like periodontitis. It is more common in adults. Number four, alveolar permeability. It is increased in younger children, thus it is usually possible to achieve local anesthesia of primary mandibular molars by infiltration alone, up to six years of age. Older than that and when the bone gets denser, you need inferior alveolar nerve block. And there you have it all. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. I'd like to have you here for more videos and follow us on Instagram at Dented Gender for extra tips and tricks.